Welcome back to Speak Out with Christine Jurgen. I am your host, and I'm hoping today's episode makes me really cool with Gen Z, um, specifically my son. I have a very special guest to share with you. She was the mom on Good Luck Charlie, a Disney series for years. She's also been in Will and Grace and a bunch of other things that you've probably heard of. She's an actress and uh, most recently was in the movie Family Camp. Her name is Lee Allen Baker, and she has been outspoken on many things lately that have kind of ostracized her from Hollywood. And uh, it turns out that she followed me, and uh, one of our employees here at Students for Life brought it up to to me that we should have her on, and I look at her account, and I'm like, okay, she follows me, so maybe that means she's pro-life. Let's find out if she's pro-life. So I invited her on, and I asked her on the episode so you get to see what she says. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Lee Allen Baker. Well, Lee Allen, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure uh, to like getting to know you a little bit on email and DM trying to like schedule this. And I'm so excited that we're finally getting it to happen. You've had a very successful career in Hollywood and I was looking at everything you've been in and was completely blown away. Stuff that, you know, I was like, wait, what? She was really in that? But you're most known for being the mom in Good Luck Charlie. You've been in uh, Will and Grace, and I'm a mom, so I know this back at the barnyard. Yes. You did the vo- you are uh, one of the voices of one of the animals and back at the barnyard. You were most recently in Family Camp and Christmas in the Pines. I just watched the trailer for Christmas in the Pines today, and I, I can't wait to watch that yes, one. Good one. It looks really, really cute. It looks really cute. Um, but that has to be so fun because so many people want a career in Hollywood and they're, you know, waiting tables and they can barely get a commercial. What was all of that like? Um, I thankfully was so bad at waitressing that I had no choice, (laughs) but to be really good at acting so I could succeed because there was no, there is an art form in waiting tables and I just did not possess it. Let's just say that. Um, You know, Hollywood is an interesting little beast and, uh, it was really so fun while it lasted, you know, it's, it's, it's become something totally different now, but I'm so glad to have been able to participate in what I think was like the fun heyday, you know, especially at Disney channel where, you know, sweet shows worried about keeping children innocent and, um, protecting family values and, um, so, and, and also equality for everybody. I mean, it was a really great place to work when I worked there. And, uh, you know, I miss it. I do miss that part of it. Was it something that, um, something that happened? Said? Yes. It's something that no. <laughs> Well, well, we'll definitely get to that. I mean, you, you consider yourself a California refugee now and you left California. How did that all come about? Like what made you leave? Was it something at the Disney channel? Was it something else? Was it politics? So it was definitely the politics, but it was more the medical interference with politics. Sure. My children had vaccine injuries and we had medical exemptions and, um, they passed a law right before COVID Uh, kind of really behind closed doors that would take away medical exemptions from only 4,000 children in the entire state that had them. And, um, and they signed a resolution stating that a mandatory vaccine schedule for adults would be advisable in the future, which is so silly. Like a resolution is just for them to say like, Hey, we're all on the same page about this, right? I mean, it's not a legal binding document by any means. Sure. But then COVID was uh, announced and I knew we were in trouble. So I knew my kids would not be able to get an education there. Uh, and so they put up quarantine camps up the street from my house. And I left the oh, next wow. day with my kids. So, so like, like actual quarantine camps. Because I saw those in the news a little bit, but I never really... I mean, I haven't seen one in person, but you've seen them. So obviously. I saw two of them in California. The one up the street from my house, it looked like a bunch of, it looked like in the middle of the beginning lockdown stages of COVID, they were going to film a movie is what it looked like. Cause there were trailers everywhere, like movie trailers everywhere. Weird. And so I stopped and I asked, and the woman said that this is a quarantine camp facility. And hmm. they had signs up for working. They wanted people who were good working with children So, uh, I put mine on a plane and left the next day to come to Tennessee where really, other than a few really paranoid people, nobody else knew there was even a virus because everybody was just living life, you know? That was probably such a relief. Such a relief. Yeah. 
So you moved to Tennessee. Things are a little bit different. It's, it's not as paranoid and strict as California was during that time. Um, but then you ended up speaking at a school board meeting, which is something that I went and watched and I was like, Oh my God, I need to beg her to be my friend now because she is such a fierce mama bear. And I, because it, they're not, there's, there's a lot of moms who've been standing up, but there's a lot who are kind of uncomfortable and they depend on people like you who are willing to stand up to the government essentially and say, no, this is not okay. Should, tell us a little bit about the uh, school board experience and how that went, because it was like, when I say it was roaring applause for you, it was, it kept going. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're still clapping for her. This is amazing. Yeah. You know, also none of that was planned. I mean, none of it. I, I, I that day was really? not going to go. I was not going to put my kids in the school system because Knew yeah. that they were up to their shenanigans with the mask. And I had read the Rockefeller manuscript called Lockstep. And I knew that the mm -hmm. way they talked about a top-down authoritative control, that the mask restricting a human's ability to breathe oxygen, the next logical step, once people complied with that, would be a vaccination, which would kill my children. So mm -hmm. I certainly wasn't yeah. going to sign them up to be murdered by the state, you know, or, you know, our federal government. So I knew, and that's because they they've had severe reactions yes. and have been vaccine injured, yes. which is a very real thing. Oh, it's a very you know, a real lot of thing. I, I mean, I have a real medical yeah. doctor that gave me a real medical exemption. You know, this is a very yeah. real thing, uh, and they know Absolutely. it. It's on the inserts. Right. People, they know, right. but then they act like when you say you're one of those people, they act like no, this only happens to like aliens on Mars or something. You know, Nobody really yeah. understands <laughs> that it's actual real people that it happens to. So, right. um, like I always tell people, if it makes you com uncomfortable that I say the word vaccines, let me just rephrase it. My children are allergic to peanuts. They had really bad reactions when they had peanuts, but now the government wants my children and everybody else to be forced to take the peanuts and it's going to kill my kids. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, so you went and spoke out against this. Yeah, I spoke out against Tennessee. the masks. And a friend of mine had said, please come. We need a voice. And I really didn't even know if I would be speaking. And I just, on my way out the door, I grabbed my Constitution Federalist Papers, a stack of books, um, the Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, and my Bible. Such a patriot. I love it. And I thought, I'm going to use this if I need to, to rally the crowds. I didn't even think I'd get in to speak, to be honest. And I certainly mm -hmm. didn't have anything planned to say. Uh, so a woman comes up to me and I, I did not have a line. I did not have a place in line speaking. You had to get there really early. So a woman came up mm -hmm. to me and said, I want you to take my number. Will you please speak for our children? I, I want you to take my number. So I took it and I, I didn't know it was going to be filmed. I was in my real ugliest mom jeans. I had just been on the all day <laughs> with my kids. My hair was like thrown up on top of my head. I had no makeup on. You know, it was not the most flattering look for me. That's how it always happens, right? right? <laughs> what is that about? So uh, they called my number and I went up and I thought, God, I'm just going to speak from the heart and you take it from there. And the next thing you know, I hear myself talking about our freedom under, you know, this is one nation under God and how grateful I am to be there, how grateful I am for, you know, the freedom to be able to speak about this. And then, I don't know, I left them with a couple parting gifts. I thanked them and I left them with some books that they needed to read, clearly. Um, <laughs> because to me, the whole, I'd been through all of this stuff with California about mandating things. And so I knew that the game was rigged. I knew the outcome and what this would be. So I thought the best that I could do was just tell them and enlighten the people there that the biggest joke of this entire situation is these people sitting in front of us don't even have the right to be making this decision. Like it's not yeah. even in their realm of job description and authority. It's not. Um, well, we're go, go ahead. So um, I just talked about our freedom to breathe oxygen and how that these books and these official documents and the Bible in particular guarantees my right and our kids' rights to breathe oxygen freely. And, uh, and then the crowd went wild. They've, 
literally wild. It was amazing. And even me, I'm like cheering in my house by myself. Um, it was phenomenal. And we need people to be able to speak up. We need people to push back on stuff like this, especially when it comes, you know, when it comes to anything that we believe in our values to be able to push back. So, um, shifting gear just a hair here, Lauren Marlowe is our social media guru at students for life. And she is the one, she messaged me your account and she was like, you should have, um, this woman on. She looks really awesome. She was on this show. It's, but she's Gen Z. I'm like, old millennial, um, or maybe geriatric millennial. I don't know what it is these days. Um, so I, I look at your page. I'm like, Oh my gosh, she follows me. So she must be pro-life or something, but I haven't officially asked you that. Are you pro-life? Yeah. You know, I'm glad you've asked me that. Um, because, uh, people kind of start around asking me certain questions and I will happily disclose cause I'm, I'm kind of an open book. Like once it's out there, the cat's out of the bag that, you know, I love Jesus and I don't, I believe in bodily autonomy and everyone's freedom in America. There's, there's really no walking that back and I don't want to walk. It back. Right. So let's move on. Um, so the way my stance used to be that I believe the propaganda that was given by the media for a long time of that, it was nothing that I would ever do myself. It was a decision that I would never be able to do that for myself. But I kind of fell in line with the idea that a bunch of men in Washington, D.C. don't have the right to make that decision for our bodies, right? Yeah. And then I started learning more about the actual process of it. And I started learning more about how the baby actually does feel pain and moves away from the needle and the brutality mm -hmm. of the actual experience for the child. And the fact that that is a child. You know, there was, there was recently a shooting and the media didn't cover it because a woman who was like, pregnant was shot and killed. And the reason that story didn't make the news is because it would inevitably, people would realize that the truth in that argument is that there were two people that were murdered that day. Two people. Yeah, absolutely. The mom and the baby, right? So yeah, yeah I'm pro-life and I am anti-vax and I'm anti-mandate and I'm pro-freedoms. So there you have it. No, I think that's beautiful. And I'm so glad that you shared it. Okay. So I just want to add one more thing to that. I don't want to hear from the left how I don't like people who have had abortions. That couldn't be further from the truth. I have nothing but compassion for people who have been through that. I have multiple friends who have had abortions. It doesn't mean that I consider myself worthy of sitting in a chair of judgment upon them because I don't. I, I have a friend who I love. I love. She is one of my ride or dies here on earth. I love her so much. She did this. Uh, she was very young. And all I can say is I've never walked in her shoes. I don't pretend to have ever walked in her shoes and gone through what she's gone through. I just know that it's a baby. Um, so when it comes to the life issue, there was something you mentioned in another podcast and you didn't get super into detail. You said you thought this was back when you're in Hollywood. You're like, I'm the only woman who wasn't at the women's March yeah. fighting for you know women's rights. Why didn't you march with them? Because last I checked, I had rights. Like, <laughs> why am I marching for rights that I already have? Listen, there's nobody in that has a different color skin than me in the United States that has a different upbringing than me in the United States that has different cultural par parents than me in the United States that has identifies as a cat, a dog, an LGBTQA, whatever. Plus there's not a single person that doesn't have the same rights that I have. What do you say to the people who say, Oh, you have to have abortion to be equal to men or, you know, we have no rights if we don't have abortion. Okay. Well, first of all, Equal rights and equal opportunity is different than us being the same. We are not the same as men. We are given this gift of having life grow in our body and being a vessel to bring it here onto this planet. So we're not the same, but we do have equal rights. But, you know, that's like saying that a man has the right to kill a baby too. Does a man have a right to walk around and kill a baby? No, they don't. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
I, I'm I am so excited <laughs> that you're pro life. Like you have no idea. I'm geeking out over here. When it comes to like people in Hollywood, they, I mean, people like you are obviously told to shush. You know, don't talk about your beliefs. We've had a few other people on who have kind of shared the same. Are there a lot of people who are pro life, or you know, um, who are anti woke? I guess you could say even in Hollywood, or is it really as like pro abortion? You know, woke as they portray. So I think what we have is some work to do to reverse the problem propaganda that's given out. So the propaganda yeah. is that, you know, they really push this narrative that if someone is brutally raped, then they're forced to carry a child. If someone is, uh, you know, um, you know, there are other instances where the mother's life is in danger and they're going to die. They're forced to carry the child. So they paint these very rare, rare, exceedingly rare circumstances, which still that's no reason to, to punish the life of a child. Right. But they, they spread the word that these circumstances are the majority and that therefore people like us have no compassion towards people who are in that brutal situation. And so we don't support their right to control their own body. Like, interestingly enough, these are the same people that wanted to force vaccinate me and my children and called us murderers during this silly pandemic, right? But um, I think there's just a lot of confusion on the propaganda. And so people actually in Hollywood, a lot of them are evil, awful people. And a lot of them are really, really good, kind people. And so yeah. they're portraying abortion as a way out, as like a mechanism of kindness to a person to find a way out of a bad situation. And I think that the reality of it needs to be taught and told and what the percentages are. It does make a difference. It does matter that people should know how small that percentage is and that the majority of people use it as a form of birth control. And Absolutely. You know, I know that at the end of the day, killing a baby is killing a baby. I understand that. But people do need to know those numbers. They, they need to have this reframed for them. Yeah. So on all the stuff that you're speaking out about, have you had people that you used to work with, you know, call you and be like, Hey, I'm totally with you. Um, you know, I'm so proud of you for speaking out. I just, I just can't do it myself. Are you getting contacted by people now that you're, you know, incredibly known for being bold at this point? I was contacted by, of all the kids that I worked with on Good Luck Charlie, I was contacted and, and I don't mean the main kids. I mean, all the kids who have ever been on the show I was contacted by two parents. Mm -hmm. Two. Wow. Uh, and I have not been contacted by anyone in the immediate cast. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, they know me, they know my heart. There's yeah. no way that they think I've just flipped my lid and I'm suddenly an evil person all of a sudden. But I think that people are afraid that if they attach to me, they will take the same heat that I took. And by heat, I mean, literally yeah. the day after that school board meeting, I was labeled a domestic terrorist by the United States president. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, it's these words hold no meaning anymore, right? It's the same as holding a pro-life position. And they're like, you know, you're misogynist. You hate people. You hate women. You're homophobic. I don't know how being uh, pro-life makes one homophobic, but you're racist. You're this, you're that. And, you know, never mind the fact that there are more black babies aborted in New York City than there are born alive. And we're saying, hey, we want all babies to be born. And that includes minority races. Absolutely. It, but the words start to hold no meaning almost because they throw them out. I always say they throw them out like beads at a Mardi Gras parade um, or like they're just Skittles and they're just, you know, it's not that big of a isn't deal. That sad? Uh, isn't that sad? It is really sad because it, th that stuff genuinely does exist. You know, there are people who um, are all of the, those awful things, but it holds no meaning anymore when you, you it's like the boy who cried wolf. Right. Almost, you know, when I said masks aren't law, I trended to number one on Twitter when I replied to Joe Biden's uh, mandatory remark as he was a nominee that he said, wear a mask. And it was a picture of him in a mask. And I said, masks aren't law. They're an overreaching suggestion. But you do you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I was immediately labeled a racist who think black lives don't matter and a homophobe. Which, how does that even like, how do you track that? Like where, <laughs> how does that work? Where is the logic? And that's the, the overall, like overreaching, or excuse me, overarching theme that I see is that there is no logic in any of this. Yes. It's kind of just, it's all emotional. It's just throw a zinger at somebody or try to offend them. 
and then maybe you get your point across, but really it just makes them look silly. Yeah, it's the point to make you shut up. We're going to make yeah. you shut up real fast because we don't like the truth you're spouting. It doesn't fit with our narrative and our Marxist agenda to tear the country apart. So we're going to shut you up real fast. We're going to call you all these things. So then after being labeled all these horrible things, you know, when my heart is not that at all, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm the kind of person where you just poked a bear. Like I'm just getting warmed yeah. up now. Now I'm really getting started. So that's when I went to the school board meeting and they decided to come out guns a-blazing as well and call me a domestic terrorist. And honestly, that's the best thing they could have done because that has been the funniest thing ever for since that. <laughs> you know, in comedy, we say that a joke has legs. It means that it lasts for a long time. That joke has such legs to label me 110 pounds, five foot one, as a dangerous domestic terrorist. Facebook even went so far as to people who are growing food in a garden are are threats. Well, you look really scary I to should me, scare so. you. You should be a scurvy. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're a mob, I mean, heck, well, I want to scare you at this point, you know? Um, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, you know, I don't want to be scary. I don't want to be this. If you're coming after my kids, you better be scared. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not you. backing down. I'm not backing yeah. down. Yeah, and that's the, you're fighting for your children, which is fighting for somebody who cannot fight for themselves. You know, it's, it's, there's so many similarities in all of this, especially when you do with your medical freedom stuff with fighting for the pre-born because you're fighting for those who don't have a voice. Do you see the same similarities there that I see? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's even further. I think that people aren't really using forethought to see that when I fight for my kids and our freedoms, I'm also fighting for everybody else's. Now, why somebody yeah. in the LGBTQ community would have a problem with me fighting for freedoms is absolutely astounding to me. Because let me just guarantee you, after they come for my freedom and yours, they're going for theirs. Like they're going right. for everybody's. You're in line. Yeah. You just might be in line behind me. But when the government is seeking this sort of total one world governance control communist dictatorship, um, it's, it, this is a plan to segregate us and then maintain control over everyone. So you'd better be locking arms with your freedom fighters because they're your best chance at this point, no matter what area of life you're choosing to live in. Absolutely. So we just um, celebrated the one year anniversary of Roe v. Wade being overturned. Do you remember where you were? When Roe was overturned, I feel like it's one of those moments that a lot of people remember. I was in my garden watering tomatoes. Um, yes, I remember. I was with my parents and, at their house visiting them. And I feel like I had a very different response than a lot of people had. Because every time something happens within our government, I'm always kind of like, hmm, what's this yeah. really about? I mean, I've learned just not to believe anything that I'm being fed and instead just start asking some questions. And I don't have all the answers. I don't pretend to have them. I can guarantee you I don't have all the answers, but I can also promise you that I have a lot of questions. And so I ask right. a lot of questions. And so I really feel that that was used as another device to further divide the United States, that it was basically the law didn't change for certain states. It was federally removed, but what it was, what happened is it was put back in the hands of the individual states, which is where legally, according mm -hmm. to the Constitution, that is where that decision was to be placed anyway. Yeah. So although it sent a message that is really bringing that subject to the forefront and hopefully getting people to listen to the truth about abortion and what it really is. Um, I, I don't think that it was this gigantic um, defeat or victory as they portrayed it. It was just placing that decision back to a state. It's just basically doing what should have been done all along, yeah. right? Like this, the state should have that, that the decision-making power 
Um, and you're right. I mean, in a sense, it's there, there was the win because it was, you know, seven men who decided this. And if you know your history about feminism, you know that it was two men who really pushed the abortion issue into feminism. And that's kind of where it all started. And I always tell people like, why would men benefit? Why are men pushing this into the feminist movement? Why, why, why? Ask why. Do your research. Figure this out. Um, but when it comes to the overturn, like that's not the end of the pro-life fight. It's not like we say, okay, you know, Roe was overturned, we're done. We definitely have more work to do because, a, like you said, it's it's a state's issue now, but also state issue, not state issue, uh, banned abortion, not a banned abo or, uh, legal abortion, you're still going to have women who are getting pregnant unplanned. You're still, it would, maybe sometimes it even is planned and then later they, you know, regret planning it. Who knows? But there's still going to be these women who need love and support and who need us to come alongside them yeah. and say, we're here with you. Um, so it doesn't erase it. I can understand that emotional, you know, kind of lack of emotions like, well, it should have been with the States the whole time anyway. Right. So I guess that was it. I didn't have an emotional attachment to that decision because I felt like it went where it was legally supposed to be according. To right. We're kind of doing the bare minimum yeah. here. Like this yeah. is, you and, know, and I, I do. The big question is, like the same with vaccines. Why can't I ask question to the most corrupt industry ever created in the history of ever, 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 you know? Sure. Why, and why can't we provide other options for women that support them and give them a chance to be a great mom or have a baby and give a child to another family that's in need of it? Like, why is why am I being shut up from saying that? How is that not a good thing? You know, why are we as people being so discouraged to discuss these things and alternate avenues to take. I mean, that's the big question is why won't the government, why won't the media, why won't social media allow us as people to discuss these things and censor us when we do? Yeah. Well, I, I've been dying to do an episode on, um, f the way that they use, um, fetal remains. Well, even live fetuses, if you really do your research in vaccines, I am like, <laughs> I'm sure YouTube would try to censor me and ban me, but it's coming. I'm going to figure out, you know, the perfect guest to have on to dive into that because that's something that I think the pro-life movement um, really needs to be aware of when we're talking about certain medications. And it's not just medicines. Uh, there's like makeup, um, you know, yeah, they're, they're they using in our food. Yes. Yes. There it's legitimately in so many things that if we actually knew we would be appalled, we would probably vomit. It's so disgusting. Um, which is why I'm like, grow your own food. Uh, if it comes from the ground or it has a mother, like, you know, cows and chickens and whatever, like it's, it's fine. Do that stuff. Don't do all the other stuff and preferably cows and chickens that haven't had any, you know, injection peanuts, I guess you could say. <laughs> I, I would um, also say that, um, People don't realize the criminality of abortion is that, just one of them, is that abortion is really big business. Yeah. So when you and I are is. talking about it's in medicine, it's in vaccines, these are in food, um, it's everywhere. It's big business. I mean, you know, there's recorded video of people, you know, haggling over the price and can they get an aborted fetus's heart completely intact? Some babies, there's mm -hmm. terminology that they have to describe when a baby is removed from the woman's uterus still alive and then they take its body parts. I mean, yeah. Organ harvesting is a real thing. And um, so there is a real brutality about this with a real upside for um, in the financial world that people aren't discussing that makes it extra disgusting. Absolutely. I mean, it, the government is corrupt in so many ways, but you know, Planned Parenthood is just as corrupt and they are one of the biggest lobbyers in DC. They're in the pockets of politicians and, you know, paying for campaigns and paying for them to get back in office essentially. And, and we're supposed to think like, oh, you have our best interest at heart. And so they have, uh, you know, something I would love to highlight here soon in another episode as well, but we could touch on briefly here, Planned Parenthood not only is, you know, doing abortions a lot of times where they're not even telling parents like yourself, um, but now they're 
dabbling in, or not dabbling in, they're doing quite a bit of it, the hormone therapy for children who are, you know, quote unquote confused. And I guarantee you a lot of times the parents don't know that they're going in for hormone therapy. So Planned Parenthood is seeing where they can make money yeah. off of people who are vulnerable. And these are people who are confused or, you know, might not really be in a, a sound state of mind. And they're going to people who, you know, they've been told in comprehensive sex ed, this is an authority figure. These people, it's Planned Parenthood. They're doctors. They know what they're doing. They have your best interest at heart. And then they go in and they're told, you know, A, get rid of it. It's a problem. You know, they're not told about all of their other options or they're told, you know, in other ways it shapes and forms, um, your body is not perfect the way it is. Here's some hormone therapy to, you know, go be a different gender, which we know is not possible. So this is Big Pharma's big dream because they get to create a customer for life, you see. And the fact that they're doing it with children is just disgusting. Um, you know, if an adult has been given informed consent, if an adult has been told these are all the drugs that you will have to be on for the rest of your life and there is still no guarantee that this will help you and that this will bring you peace or make you feel whole, um, this will... Um, have some serious side effects with it. There are some serious dangers involved and it could cut your life short. If after all of that, an adult still wants to make that decision, look, it's a free country. That's their decision to make. But to start hacking off body parts and chemically castrating children is beyond neglect. It's full-blown nefarious and evil. Yeah, it's completely abusive. And those people should be completely locked up. Uh, that, and that's Planned Parenthood's agenda, though. You know, you go after those who are vulnerable and in places where they're confused. You know, a lot of times when I talk to women who are in unplanned pregnancies, it's it's not like I want to have an abortion many of the times, the majority of the time. It's I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't, I don't, I can't pay my rent next week. Um, I can't put food on the table for my children. And do you see Planned Parenthood saying, hey, let us help you with your groceries or, you know, let us help you here, uh, you know, with your rent? No, we never see that. And that's why, you know, when it comes to people who are profiting off of these decisions that people are making in vulnerable places, I have zero trust for any of them, whether it is the, the gender therapy that they're doing. Um, they say therapy, I mean, gender abuse, I'd call it. Um, or the abortion issue because they are manipulating people and they're lying in the process of saying, this is going to make you happier. Thank you for lining my pockets. Um, but in, in a sense with abortion, even they are creating a lifelong customer many times because there are women who, um, suffer from suicidal thoughts who then get put on medication for depression. There are women who, you know, have perforated uteruses who then have to go back in for more procedures. Um, you know, uh, insomnia is something that they deal with. And then, you know, you get on medication for ins insomnia and a lot of times they don't know to, uh, connect these issues and, it kind of, you know, this abuse toward women and children is something that they, they do to make a salary. It's disgusting. Yeah. And they write about it too. You know, um, Warren Buffett put in one of his books that a mandated vaccine schedule, I compare it to that too, because it's all pharma, um, is the only untapped financial market at the, that we need to get adults going in the same road that we get children do because it's such a, a, a big payday. Yeah. Well, when you really research and I know there's people who are pro vaccine, there's people who are, you know, medical freedom. And I wouldn't even say, and there are people who are completely anti-vax like, Hey, it's just all bad. You know, there's people in every single camp and regardless of what camp people are in, um, and, and this relates to the life issue. I feel like people really, really should be doing their research. You know, when yes. you go to, and this is my own personal belief, I won't speak on behalf of students for life by any means, but when I go into the doctor's office for my child and they say, Hey, you have to do this peanut. I say, can you tell me five ingredients that are in it? And they sit there and look at you and they're like, Why, nobody's ever asked me this. I actually don't know what's in it. So Okay, why can you? Why should you um, feel that you can say, my child needs this, my perfectly healthy child needs this, and you can't even list anything in it? I'm not even asking uh, a, a pro uh, anti-vax stance here right now or question. I'm just saying, can you tell me what's in it? 
And if you can't, and I, if I know more about this than you, I'm probably not going to take any advice from you. I'm going to do my own research. I'm going to look at the inserts. I'm going to figure this out for myself. And I think that this is something that the COVID thing um, really enlightened a lot of parents about. And I wish maybe I had a little bit more insight a long time ago, but there, there's a lack of education on that. But I see, it's like, I keep seeing the parallels between uh, big pharma there in that industry in your, your pediatrician's office and also big pharma in the way they educate or train these people who work at abortion clinics. They don't necessarily, a lot of them don't really fully understand. They think they're helping women. You know, they don't have the full blown education, um, that other people do. Obviously abortionists do, they know exactly what they're doing and what comes out and, and what's going on. But there's a lot of people who have bought the lie that they're helping women. This is just how you help women. Well, they certainly don't show you all the ways to critically think about different options and ways to help women or yeah. people or children. What they do is they have their one narrative and they teach them, they indoctrinate them on this is what you sell to them. This is how you do it. Oftentimes they're even given a script. And I just want to mm -hmm. just, this is, I just want to show you something real quick. So, um, this is the research that I've done on vaccines. Holy smokes. So if anybody, you know, wants to debate me on that or question me on that, like they're free to do so. But nobody has researched more than a mother whose children have been injured. Nobody. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm so sorry that that happened to your children. I, um, was listening to one of the podcasts that you were on and you were talking about, um, one of your children became delayed after the fact. And I have a good friend who had, uh, the exact same, and this is a lot of what woke me up too a little bit or made me at least second guess things whose son was, um, similar to your child was completely, you know, running and talking and just fine. And then all of a sudden, um, there were issues not talking anymore. And, it's heartbreaking that any mother would ever have to go through that, you know, especially with what we see and the fact that you can't hold these people accountable. They're not coming to take care of your children. You are. And, and that's, it's a heartbreaking situation. So I'm, I'm so sorry that you've had to go through that, but I'm, I'm so glad that you are speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves. And then for all the moms who've had to see situations like this and, you know, maybe aren't believed. Right. That's the problem. The problem is, and I think that this is one of their downfalls too, is that it's not just that these things happen and they acknowledge it and they know, and they're there to help you. It's that these things happen. They know they call you a liar, a murderer, and all sorts of names. Like you are not apologized. Like I'm not given a parade for doing my civic duty to vaccinate my children and then having this injury. I'm not thrown a parade for bravely coming out about what happened to my children. No, I'm yeah. outcast from society and, and labeled a murderer for not continuing to vaccinate them for the greater good. Yeah. So yeah. people's response is absolutely shocking to me that there is no compassion or there's very little compassion. Absolutely. Well, Lee Allen, your boldness is completely contagious. And I am so grateful that you were willing to come on here. Um, and I think I, I, at least as far as I could find, this is the first place that you have like publicly come out as you come out as a lot of things, yeah. but come out as being pro-life. And so we are honored that you shared that with us and um, love the advocacy you're doing and fighting for the vulnerable in every way. And especially now being on this podcast cast and willing to um, stand up for the pre-born who cannot speak for themselves. I end every episode with one last que question. And because your um, boldness is so contagious, I want to ask you if you could say anything to those listening, because it is sometimes uncomfortable to speak out. Um, you know, the fear of being canceled or losing your job. If you could say one thing to them to encourage them to speak out, what would you say? I would say we need to just make courage contagious, make boldness beautiful, and worry about what your father thinks of you and not what others think of you. Amen. Okay. I lied. One last question. Mm -hmm. Can we hang out if I'm ever in Tennessee? Yes. Because I absolutely. really think we would be besties. <laughs> yes.
<laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's been a pleasure. And you know what? By seeing that book, maybe you're the person that I have on again and we talk about things later on and, and get a little bit more in depth on that issue. Uh, thank you for joining Lee Allen.